It is a real privilege to be invited to introduce um, our, uh, our speaker this evening, who is an incredibly interesting speaker um, and is here from a much loved and admired organisation. At this time, organisations in many sectors are finding recruiting employees to be challenging. I know that the topics our speaker is going to cover this evening are things that many people care very deeply about. As an HR professional, I also know that the values that employers display through their actions can make a real difference to how they're viewed by potential employees seeking to make their next career move. It is for this and many other reasons that I will be listening with great interest to this evening's talk. As well as being the chair of the Shakespeare's Globe, um, our speaker is also Chancellor of Coventry University and a current board member for the co-op. In 2018, she was awarded a CBE for services to charity and promoting diversity. As well as those well-known names that I've just mentioned, um, her current portfolio also includes advising young entrepreneurs, supporting and advising organisations on governance, and advising people, particularly those from underrepresented groups who wish to embark upon a board career. As such, it is my great and sincere pleasure to hand over to our speaker for this evening, Margaret Casely Hayford. Good evening, and thank you so much, Shelley, for that wonderful welcome. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here this after, this evening to speak with you all. And the title of my lecture is Trust and Governance, Where To Now? The subtitle for the talk as originally published suggested that I would have a solution for climate change and inequality. I wish I did, but in all honesty, my suggestion is simple and could lead to better outcomes in both of those respects. But the, those are enormous problems and I can hardly devise a, a solution simple-handedly. So in essence, my premise is that we have for generations trusted government to deliver on major problems, and yet we demonstrably no longer have trust in government to the extent that we once did. And the electoral system is just far too blunt an instrument for allowing corrections midstream or making the government even listen to us outside of the lobby system. But allied to the power that government holds is the fact that major enterprises now command the wealth and influence, often of small nations, I mean, absolute massive um, influence these days. And the might of our investment or trading power as consumers means that we're key stakeholders and we could demand better from corporates and businesses. So my talk will take, first of all, an overview of the current debate, unpack the um, overview by reference to some facts on trust, reference a number of organisations that I've been privileged to work with, and then I'll posit a few proposals on which I would really welcome questions and comments in due course. So even as a person who's been involved in governance in one way or another all my life, or, or my working life, whether as a lawyer in the City of London, or as Director of Legal Services for the John Lewis Partnership, or as Chair of Action Aid UK, the last few months have been a real surprise for me, as I'm sure they have for you. And we might ask ourselves questions about whether we've squandered the opportunity to build well, let alone better, as we emerge from the pandemic, or whether we took any meaningful strides to deal with climate change um, coming out of COP26, or whether we've learned any of the hard lessons about not facing into the challenges of inequality or racism, and whether our governance structures are robust enough or capable of enabling us to avoid corruption, cronyism, social division, and all of these uh, really massive questions and would take far longer than the half an hour that I've been given to talk with you this evening. So what I'll do is I'll start by touching on the relationship between trust and governance. And I suppose the first thing is really to, to sort of decide what governance is as, as, as we see it, and then we can build on that. So governance has historically encapsulated a litany of rules, bodies of policies, frameworks for acceptable behaviour, and the need for a balance of a raft of interests. And the tools that we've had for dealing with, with governance are obviously board composition, regulatory oversight, the imposition of duties, fiduciary duties through trust, trusts and, and corporate institutional constitutions, management of executive pay, 
and the way that stakeholders are recognised and their competing interests are, are basically handled. And over the last few months, uh, what was formerly a sort of obscure acronym has taken over the media's view of an additional element of how we look at, at um, governance. And you, you will have seen the initials ESG arising in more and more discussions and debates. And that really has a bearing on the stakeholders, you know, the, whose interests we should really bear in mind as businesses, ESG. And what does ESG really, really mean? And the initials that basically just cover environmental, social and governance considerations. But let's just unpack that a little bit and decide what sits under each of those before we move forward. Environmental being pretty wide impact on conservation of the natural world, having regard to climate change, carbon emissions, reductions, limiting potential air and water pollution, reducing waste and, and um, similar um, really massive issues. Social needs are slightly um, less easy to pin down because it's basically a consideration of people and relationships, including employee interests, their development, um, which of course, from an HR perspective, we're very um, focused upon. Well-being, also of customers, and um, customer satisfaction, data protection, and privacy, health and safety, and particularly heightened that is a focus um, as we, we um, try to emerge from the pandemic. And then on the governance side, we've got standards and indicators used for giving us as consumers and giving investors comfort about the prudent and I suppose I hope, I hope the appropriate ways that companies are running their organisations, including the impact of risks on their strategic direction and how board is managing those. And so if business is to consider ESG in, in its proper perspective, that widens its relationship its role within society. And unsurprisingly, that's become a topic of discussion for pundits as well as C-suite executives, and you'll see, you've seen that in the press. And some, are, some say that that demands that business should have a focus beyond keeping the business in profit. They say that purpose is its obligation to wider society. And others say that the purpose is still to be achieved focusing on business profit, profitability and improvement of the asset value of the business. But that actually comes out of managing those risks properly. So the risks of knowing how to balance all of those stakeholder interests. And that, that again, the, the difference between those two perspectives is pretty big, but we can't go into that in great detail. But there are some great blogs, um, for example, on the Institute of Directors website, which dive into that. But from my view, if businesses to retain public trust, directors have to take a broader perspective and move away from the, what I think is a damaging um, idea that the sole responsibility of the company is to increase its profits. And helpfully, we've just had the recent example of Spotify making a decision to um, focus on their commercial interest in that they had a, a hugely lucrative uh, contract with Joe Rogan for $100 million and Basically, musicians like Neil Young entering into a day bar call with them and saying, you know, we're leaving you if you don't split your relationship with Joe Rogan, which has both been embarrassing for Spotify and has caused their share price to fall quite dramatically. And whatever side you come down on, the value of the enterprise has to be gauged not just by its financial assets, but by the way it anticipates and handles risks like that that might arise um, under any of the three headings of the ESG that I outlined. So in other words, the attitude to a wider purpose also counts towards its positive value and has a relevance for investor, investment purposes, as well as in terms of judging its own long-term resilience. So if, let's say for example, we took a soft drinks manufacturer, should they sensibly think about the wider consumption of water? Um, and, and then should they therefore help communities that are the most deprived of water so that the substance that they rely on for the production of their commodity doesn't actually become restricted in supply or prohibitively expensive because of its scarcity in the medium to longer term. Now, whether that's resilience or altruism, it's still good business logic for them to have that wide perspective. And I'll refer later in my own experience to companies which interpreted their purpose in the wider sense of their own volition, 
But these were companies that were founded in a more benign time when the planet wasn't in such peril, a time when it was acceptable to leave it to businesses to decide for themselves. And I'm supportive now of something that's more forceful because of the perils we face. So I'm going to spend some time examining a legislative proposal that's been supported by a new initiative that many companies have already signed up to called the Better Business Act. But we might ask ourselves whether there's much point in the stick of legis legislation if there isn't also the carrot of cultural acceptance of what's proposed. So in other words, what would happen if the Better Business Act was became legislation, but leaders didn't believe in it and therefore treated it in the same way as some of our leaders have treated the lockdown regulations, allegedly. Um, and how do we obtain the cultural shift that supports adoption and compliance if the law is introduced? But let's first of all think about how we got here. As we slowly emerged from the pandemic, there was a growing consensus that business must be run in a way that takes account of a broader set of interest from BlackRock's Larry Fink to the incoming chair of the Financial Reporting Council, Jan Duplessis, there have been calls for businesses to serve the interests of their various stakeholders far better. And it's clear that a debate is raging about it, but, but I think it's worth in investigating why that's happening and understanding why the participation of companies in these matters is as important as it seems to be becoming. As I've pointed out elsewhere, some of the largest and thereby most powerful organisations today are corporations rather than governments. In 2021, Walmart had no, 2.3 million employees, and that ranks with the People's Liberation Army of China as the joint second largest employer in the world, and second only to the American Defence Department, which according to um, 2015 records employed 3.2 million people then. Amazon employs 1.3 million people, so you can see the magnitude of these enterprises. And in terms of revenue, the World Economic Forum records that compared with the GDP of nations, Walmart would be 10th largest entity in the world. It's big stuff. So arguably, we might sensibly impose on them, on these corporations, and in fact on all corporations, um, a wider purpose than purely to be commercially successful for the benefit of shareholders. They should also help us deal with the many major issues that we currently face insofar as these issues might consider, be considered relatable to the business's operation. And in its programme, Future of the Corporation, the British Academy says that this level of corporate responsibility lies at the heart of the future of capitalism, the future of humanity and the future of our planet. So we're talking pretty big stuff here. Interestingly, more and more investors already take the view that an acknowledgement of a wider purpose demonstrates an additional asset value that's actually quantifiable when it comes to assessing the value of the company. In fact, the International Corporate Governance Network, which is an organization that's made up of asset owners and managers responsible for investment assets of about $60 trillion, has said that understanding the purpose of the company calls for deep reflection and a long-term perspective, balancing the needs and interests of investors, as well as other key stakeholders, with a social role that gives rise to thinking about those three aspects, environmental, social and governance factors, which should be built into the company strategy. That's pretty huge, but there is another important set of reasons, and they come out of where we place our trust today. Now, the Edelman Trust Barometer is a really helpful index and it's published regularly and has been for 20 years now. And it tells us about how much or how little our trust profile has shifted over the period. And the latest one comes out literally tomorrow. So sadly, I can't dive down and tell you into where we are at present. But last year's one, I, I think, is still pertinent. And in last year's one, they noted that government was most trusted as an institution as of May 2020. But by June 2021, only months later, our trust in business had surged forward and that led in both competence and ethics. So government had gone from being a leader in competence and ethics um, to business being a leader in competence and ethics within months. And that was the case in all areas except one critical area and that of climate change. With regard to climate change across all age groups and demographics, government was more trusted than business. And having said that, no institution 
was found to be trusted to cope with this on its own. And in fact, 50% of people felt that it was probably too late to do anything anyway, but that's by the by. The biggest problem is that as far as um, data is concerned, there is um, increasingly little trust, but govern government, government remains at leadership uh, in terms of climate change, but it's at, at 17 points below, um, uh, sorry, so business is 17 points below government on the barometer, but government is 23 points behind business when it comes to competence, really important. So bear that in mind as I just sort of quickly look at two enterprises that I've been privileged to belong to, which have always had purpose embedded within the way in which they look at and plan their strategy. So I've been lucky enough to be part of the co-op and the John Lewis partnership. And, and, and as I say, they have had purpose which involved a wider range of stakeholders than was traditionally the case with ordinary equity-based enterprises. So from 2016, I've been a, a, an a elected non-executive director on the board of the co-op, which is a, ten, a ten, nine or 10 billion, uh, the pandemic had, had an impact, uh, turnover business with social purpose embedded at its core. And it was established actually to help the communities in which it trades. Uh, it was founded in the 1860s by the Rochdale pioneers. And it came out of surveys that found that men in the north of England were dying 15 to 20 years younger than men in the south of England due to, in part, consumption of contaminated foodstuffs. So, for example, flour was contaminated with chalk. And they promised that if they were able to sell, they would guarantee quality of produce at affordable prices. And over the next century, the cooperative wholesale group went through many changes and eventually became the cooperative group. And over the pandemic, it employed a team of member pioneers to link people together to the local communities to find out what the communities needed, money, skills, time. And there were a thousand member pioneers specifically dedicated to doing that within the community. And it readily supports food banks. And it was one of the first food retailers to get behind Marcus Rashford's campaign to feed, feed children. And all that came out of having purpose embedded as a fundamental value. And the key stakeholders were constantly born in mind, doing the right thing, um, even if that's difficult. But it meant that it had to be careful about not spending huge amounts of money on, say, advertising, trying to invest in price to make things affordable, but not pushing so hard that it made life difficult for another key stakeholder, suppliers. And so its infrastructure means embedding values and making adjustments so that it was balancing the interests as it went along. Turning to John Lewis, when I joined them in 2006, it was clear to me that they had inherited a structure that saw purpose as supporting the financial imperative. And it was founded by someone called John Speed and Lewis, and he has written about this in a book called Partnership Four. It's not a very big book, but it is massive in its, its ambitions and its principles. And he outlined that business enterprises should highlight key stakeholders. And he was really a forerunner in this, because this the turn of the 20th century, he was saying the key stakeholders were the customer, the supplier, neighbors, the community, we should tread lightly on the environment. And he said that with the ordinary businesses, it's the people who invest their money who are the primary stakeholders. And he said that what we ought to do is to think about the fact that those who employ, who, who invest, their energy and their time are equally valuable. So he made employees another critical stakeholder. And so very, very similar to the sorts of areas of impact that um, ESG is asking businesses to look at. And I'm not saying that he was necessarily altruistic because he saw it as a better way of doing business, but it, the outcomes were very similar because essentially what you're doing is you're trying to make sure you're building an environment in which the business can thrive. What's interesting is that the focus on the sustainability agenda and ESG as a method of analyzing the critical way that businesses should explain themselves strategically is actually making businesses look hard at delivering with that wider purpose in mind and thinking about them that in terms of their long-term prof profitability. And that's great because in a way, it means that they've got to make sure that purpose is interpreted in a way that builds trust. Because 
what you're doing is you're saying, we're going to listen to you as stakeholders. We're going to receive data from you. We'll give back a certain amount of data. So that means that, that a certain degree of transparency has to be required. And we will report back to you on the way in which we're delegating responsibility through the organization, what our oversight me me measures are, and what our framework is for calling out errors so that we can respond to those errors and deal with them appropriately. And that's really good as a cultural shift. It's really important. And I'll give you just one example of the importance of that cultural shift. If you think back to the bearings collapse, those of you who are old enough to remember that, I, mean, I, have, to, I have to remember those students on this call, Bearings collapsed in 1995 with losses of £827 million, pounds, which at, at, at the time, which now is calculated as something in line of £1.6 And if you Google that, you'll see that Google, I think it's Wikipedia, says that that was a result of employee Nick Leeson, um, who um, sort of fraudulent investments brought down the bank. But I would say that in reality, this was a, it was more than that. It was a classic example of a macho culture in which those who delivered financial success, like Nick Leeson, were not questioned robustly about their methods. They weren't supported sufficiently and they didn't feel comfortable in calling out the errors. And I say that because he first of all lost 20 million. And then rather than saying, oh my goodness, this has happened, please help to the senior managers, he gambled and tried to get rid of it. He got to a point at which he'd um, lost something in the region of 235 million and still didn't report it back. Now, they were capitalized with reserves of 350 million. So he, even at that stage, they could still have been saved from collapse. But he went on his merry way. And this is in a regulated industry. So I'm saying that it's evident that regulation without a good culture is impossible to enforce properly. So you, you, you actually need to have um, the balance of the two, otherwise you don't get the compliance that you, you require and the integrity that you require through the organization if we want business to be better. So what is it that we're asking governments to do to help us there? We're saying government has to compel change. Government's got to be the mandator. And we have to say that, that um, Let's think about, for example, what happened in the early stages of the pandemic when government was trusted, more trusted than it probably is now to lead. And they mandated us to do various things, stay at home, maintain distance, wash hands, sing happy birthday, wear masks, um, take vaccines. And the rollout began and, and that enforced a good deal of change. And it went tolerably well because there was the data that underpinned the mandate. And what's interesting is, again, the Edelman barometer shows that as far as trust is concerned, we trust scientists. And the, the index shows scientists first, peers second in terms of trust, NGOs in terms of trust regards data. So this is for data, scientists, peers, and NGOs. And at the very bottom, when it comes to data information, government leaders, journalists, and CEOs are right at the bottom. So government is trusted to mandate, but if it's supported by data, underpinned by scientific evidence and business is trusted to deliver. So you can see where this is going. Business is trusted above government, but not on sustainability, because it's clear that with environment, there's a credibility gap. Jason Clay, who is an executive director of the WWF, has pointed out that in explaining, in explaining the reasons for that credibility gap, that companies made commitments at the last environment summit before COP26 and back in 2010, but they had made commitments that they would have achieved certain targets by 2020. And it was found that when there was a look back in 2020, that there was a 400 billion pound deficit between the commitments and what they'd actually delivered. Hence the lack of trust. So in explaining um, the failure to follow up, he actually said talk is cheap. But I would say that talk is bloody expensive because of what has basically done to erode our trust at such a critical time in our bid to save the planet. So um, I listened further to Clay, but he has he advocates some very sound actions and I stand four square with him on this. He says business should make commitments, they should publish them so that there's transparency of intention, carry out an analysis and say this is the baseline proposition, this is where we are, we're going to set benchmarks, 
set a timeline against which we're going to deliver and then the public can monitor the progress and then um, we can report back on that and in order that competitors don't feel they can get away with it lobby for standard data sets legislation and mandates that all seems to make sense with me if it's underpinned by scientific data because as i said scientists scientists are more trusted than businesses um, and they have the information anyway so I suppose then the watchword is don't go it alone, insist that your supply chains meet complementary targets to help reduce the impacts. And CEOs, you're the least trusted. So whether it's because they people see you as self-serving or expensive, I really don't know. But I would say that it's partly because you're anachronistic in, your, in the way you look at things. You're still looking at experts who have financial capability. And that was great for a time when the imperative was to deliver on the bottom line. And that's not the sole imperative any longer. There's no point having asset rich companies if the planet is dead or dying with horrible Armageddon consequences for all of us. It's time for CEOs to be appointed who bring in an expertise in areas that understand the imperatives of these other key stakeholders. So on a basic level, it's very apparent that years ago, when pure unbridled capitalism was king and primary stakeholders were the shareholders, it was important only to ensure the financial health of the organization. So audit committees and remuneration committees were critical. And the report on accounts looked in just that one direction to the bottom line, never to the results for any of the other key stakeholder um, elements that John Sweden Lewis was asking people to look, look at. And now it's time for there to be boards that have an ESG focus or to establish an ESG committee so that board, at board level there's oversight and management of these key areas of risk. So similarly, Previously, there was a regulatory focus that was purely financial, but we're saying again that, uh, or I'm saying, and the business, the, 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 those behind the Better Business Initiative, which I mentioned earlier, are saying that we should be looking much more widely. Companies should now be thinking about um, more than extracting the maximum value from all resources, more than um, seeing humans and environmental uh, um, uh, um, resources as purely exploitative for their purposes. It's not just all about shareholder value, it's about stakeholder value as well. It's not all about executive remuneration being incentivized to take out enough for the company, allowing for the bottom line to be for the uh, investors. Workers can't be seen as a resource. Their career development shouldn't be seen as an, an interesting byproduct of the company just doing better. Um, we're in an era now in the 21st century when employees or workers will just walk if they're viewed purely as a resource. And the COVID-19 pandemic has made us aware that even the lowest paid undoubtedly have critical value to the effective operation of the industry. Business leaders underestimate their value to the peril of the business. Building back better needs structural change. It's not merely that individuals on minimum wage are now demanding and can command more, but as the HGV driver shortage across Europe has shown, they have leverage to, mark, to demand better working conditions. Young people want to be developed. We saw that the level of agreement at COP26 that we need to stop treating the environment as a never ending resource to be plundered, and we need to be more benevolent when we look at people as a resource. So we're in a world, uh, we, we, oh, also we're in a world in which the population um, growth in, in uh, developed countries is slowing. So the elderly workforce is also asking to be supported. Um, so they need to be upskilled continually because you're going to have to invest in them for the future. You're also going to have to invest in them when it comes to not just making them mentally agile, but physically fit and capable to continue. So they will want to um, have better health care and so on. So we need to see the purpose of business as helping a wider spectrum of individuals, um, actually helping um, the individuals, but also on the geopolitical spectrum, countries and communities that might need support. So shoring up their strength helps our resilience. But let me just dive down a little bit more into the Better Business Act. Um, I mean, I recognise that directors already have numbers of responsibilities in law. And that starts with the Companies Act of 2006, Section 172. And that is obviously asking them to promote the success of the company. And that says that in doing that, they should have regard to 
other aspects like the long term interests of the employees um, and foster good relationship with suppliers and customers um, and also think about the impact on the environment. But that's not good enough because that isn't actually imposing a duty. And the Better Business Act initiative takes a view that we need to be better. So a group of businesses, including the John Lewis Partnership, came together in April 2021, virtually, because we were still in lockdown. And um, they basically um, decided that they should begin a campaign calling for changing the law that governed businesses to strengthen it and make it much more explicit that you could no longer um, subjugate the long-term interests of people and planet to profit alone. So businesses across the UK have proven already that you can enjoy sustainable growth and drive innovation and entrepreneurship and balance that with purpose. And I've mentioned John Lewis and I've mentioned the co-op as examples, but the campaign is urging all of Britain's business leaders to call the government to change section 172 to make sure that businesses are responsible benefiting the workers, thinking about benefits to customers and communities and the environment whilst delivering their profit. And the intention is that directors take responsibility for the direction of the business in this respect. And to achieve this, the campaign's asking for a broader and growing coalition. And I'm asking everyone out there who's listening today to think about how they might be supportive of this, because it's a new contract between business and society. So now the thing is, the law always follows morality. It's always a little bit slow, it drags behind. So it's probably fitting that the Better Business Act is gaining momentum now because we're all frankly heartily fed up we expected more out of cop 26 we want coherent delivery in a relatively short space of time we want directors to weigh up the interests of the stakeholders that i've referred to and to define and align their interests with, with um, and purpose with that of the business we want to see how the directors are delegating those responsibilities so that they can deliver the ambitions of the wider purpose. We want transparency about that amb ambition. We want them to state it publicly so we can see what they're doing to meet the objectives and how well they're progressing to make the necessary changes. We want them to monitor and report so we can tell if they're delivering. And that should be the default position. It should no longer be optional as it was in the days when the co-op was founded and, and John Lewis Partnership was founded. So big things that we're asking there. Um, but we have to balance the interests of people, planet and profit and, and, and report strategically on what we're going to do to, to, to um, improve the outcomes. The culture's got to be right, so let's keep talking to government to make sure that we get the right sort of leadership. But um, it was good. I, well, frankly, I think we do, we, if we, we don't do so, we do so. We ignore that at our peril in the peril of the planet. But obviously, I have to be quite realistic here because I recognize in closing that there are three different types of companies. Firstly, there's the companies that have no touch points with society. So like the defense industry, if you're in the business of sending weapons for killing people, your societal reference is not going to be really such that you're going to want to be a better business in any of these areas, I would posit. But if you're a customer facing business like retailers, um, there are so many touch points and it's in your interest to make sure that your customers are fit and well, the supply chains and the disposal mechanisms are non-toxic, the employees are happy and so on as I've outlined. And so you, we can operate with the, uh, those companies, but also the, 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 other, the other thing to remember with those companies is that they are in, in competitive markets, which helps them to behave better. We saw that with Spotify. It was the fact that musicians and customers could go off elsewhere to other platforms that made Spotify think, oh, crikey, let's think about how we can regulate old Joe Rogan so and try and prevent the stampede away from us. Because the third category of business is the monopoly. And the monopoly is like the water company, some of the major media companies and train companies. Lack of competition makes them succeed actually in failing society because they can continue to pay huge dividends to their investors. So what we want is legislation that makes them responsible for ensuring that they aren't going, for example, to be fouling the waterways with sewerage um, or um, undermining the mental growth of our youngsters through the, the, the media platforms. 
or running the trains completely inefficiently. So how do you do that with a monopoly? Because there isn't the competition that can keep, keep them in check. And that probably demands what a barrister friend of mine calls aggressive legislation, which, for example, demands that no dividends are going to be payable unless the regulator is satisfied that certain independent sets of standards are being met. It's not nationalisation, so don't be frightened. Those of you who are frightened of that sort of um, uh, uh, political environment that we once had. It's responsible capitalism. So that's really what we're asking for. It's what I'm asking for. I hope that hasn't been too provocative, but sufficiently provocative to get some responses from you. I'd love to hear what you've got to say. So handing over now back to Martin for questions and comments from you. Thank you so much for listening. Thought provoking and very interesting talk indeed. And I can see that there are a number of questions uh, coming in. So without more ado, we'll hand over to the to the questions. And the first question is, if world leaders cannot be trusted to act, how can the people take a more active role in the governance of actions to meet the commitments made at COP26? OK, um, I think that um, essentially that it really is at the heart of really what I've been talking about here, because I think that what what we're doing is saying that um, business has to help us deliver um, because we do have leverage over business. We have leverage over business in so many different ways. Um, we have leverage over business because we are very often the investors, our pension funds are the investors, we are the customers, we can walk away from businesses that don't have the right, um, uh, the, 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 the right uh, um, strategic direction. Um, it was really interesting to see that one of the major investors, Aviva, um, recently said that they would actively remove their investments from um, enterprises that didn't show that the directors had a strategic responsibility for um, uh, um, climate change reduction, uh, 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 greenhouse gas reduction and other major um, uh, imperatives. So I think that's really the, the, the the, the mandate here is to is to control what we can control. Um, as I said, I think it's a blunt instrument to try to control government because the periods over which government is in power are so long that they can get to the point where they really don't listen to us very well. I hope that's not too depressing. <laughs> uh, the next question is, uh, what do you see as the societal role of universities? Oh, what a great question. Um, as Chancellor of Coventry University, um, I am really keen that universities should work alongside government and should, um, wh what I mean by that is, um, work alongside government in terms of trying to make sure that um, uh, business is sufficiently agile in um, upskilling um, the workforce, um, creating what we, for example, at Coventry call um, the uh, faculty on the factory floor. So in other words, creating live opportunities for people to um, continue being skilled up during the course of their working life in a really practical way. And so that there's a marriage between the uh, courses and the practical um, uh, relationship that they have with business. Um, I, it's it's such a huge subject, this one, because there are so many different ways in which this could be organised. And for example, local authorities could be um, uh, part of the sort of triangulation of this effort in getting the authorities to suggest that enterprises that come into a city for the first time actually think about talking to the university about the skilling needs um, and actually paying into a, a paying a bond, for example, into a fund, so that uh, the skilling needs of that enterprise can be uh, maintained for as long as that enterprise stays, and even better to make sure that the the bond stays in check. So if they decided, if it was a major employer that decided to close down, the individuals would not be redundant. Their jobs might be redundant, but they wouldn't be because they could be skilled to go on into something else. And so a financial bond to enable that and to help the, the universities um, actually pay a, a, a really um, critical part in 
preserving the life of the community, I can see is something really strong for the future. So, um, yeah, I, I've got very big plan to ensure that government takes notice of us forever in the day, <laughs> rather than sidelining us. Keep note of those uh, answers to that one, uh, Margaret. Um, the next question for you is, do you think that individuals can make a difference or can they only do that as part of larger organisations? Um, individuals, gosh, this is huge again, because um, the answer is yes and no. I think that if we are not given respect by give, being given data, um, it's really hard for us to know how impactful and meaningful anything we're doing actually really is. Whereas on the other hand, if we really understand the impact of what we're doing, we can start directing our energy in a really, really important way. We can collaborate, we can communicate on a, in a wider, uh, uh, with a wider sphere of, of influence. And in fact, that, I suppose that comes out of the reason why I'm so proud to be a, um, a director of the co-op, because that really is the essence of the cooperative movement. It was individuals getting together and saying, let's do this together for greater impact that really created the essence of those little cooperative societies that eventually became the cooperative wholesale society, that became the co-op group. And that can happen in any form of cooperation. Um, you, you begin to understand through uh, getting data what the impact is of what you do, um, and, and then you can operate in a greater sphere of influence with a greater sphere of influence. Thank you. Um, our, our next question is: um, Do you agree that rather than the climate crisis, we should be focusing on solving the poverty crisis? Um, well, then they're very engaged with each other, really, aren't they? Um, the, the poorest people in the world are the ones who suffer most out of um, uh, any and every change in climate. Um, they, they can recover least quickly from the adverse impacts of climate change. So one of the things that we need to do is to think about the fact that at the other end of supply chains, um, at the um, and, and in, in the poorest communities, there are people who um, to whom we should be looking um, for to understand best how to help them. Um, I think it's very easy for us to in in, in the uh, privileged um, developed world to impose. Um, what we think is right for the poorest. Um, and whether that's the poorest within our own society or the poorest elsewhere, those who have the privilege think that they know what's right. And again, I think this goes back to the, the last question. The best way to get people out of poverty is to empower them. And I, and I was chair of ActionAid UK, and that was ActionAid's mandate. ActionAid never goes in you know, sort of with a clipboard and says, this is what you do. Um, ActionAid um, has offices in various countries and various locations, empowered by local people and, um, and run by local people. They know best what their community needs. And it's the same here in the UK. People in the locality know best what, what is needed. And the moment you give them the wherewithal to be able to change their environments. You're creating a structured change. You're creating long lasting change. I mean, it, there is that really um, very hackneyed point about, you know, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day and give him a fishing line and you, you, know, you empower him to feed himself. And it, it is, it, 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 it's basically that, isn't it? But you, you, what we should be doing with the poorest is, is giving them a system help, works, help helps them. The system starts with respecting them listening to them, getting the data about what the impact is of what you're doing. And then from there, they can help to change their own environment. Well, they do change their own environments because they're empowered to. And I feel, I actually feel incredibly strongly about this. And, that, and my time as chair of Action Age UK was some of the, 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 the best, albeit saddest, because of what I could see wasn't happening. But what I could see was happening, what, what was being done by Action Aid made me realise that that is a model for everywhere, not just for the poorest countries in the world. Thank you for that question. I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs>
So the next one is, how do you persuade companies to bear in mind communities on which they are not dependent? Uh, and it says, for example, um, they will never be consumers, employees or investors. Um, I think, I mean, isn't it, I might be misunderstanding the question, but I think that that was, that was the point I was trying to make when I said I needed to be realistic right at the very end in closing that there are three different types of companies. There are some that have no touch points with communities. So that, the, you know, for example, people who sell armaments, um, you know, frankly, how do you realistically get them to think about the adverse impact on the environment, the adverse impact on communities um, on their supplies? They really don't care. Their business is about killing. So we have to be realistic. There are some that won't. But on the other hand, there are some that, um, might at first think that they don't have a relationship with communities but can be persuaded and i remember years ago again this was when i was chair of action Aid uk talking to um people within the energy industry about the impact of their um, oil and gas exploration in, on fishing companies in um, nigeria and how um the, the waters were being so heavily contaminated that the, they basically were, were just killing the communities completely and um it was really interesting to hear the responses because they were saying, well, even if we as, as energy producers were um, to take a responsible attitude and think about um, making sure that we work well for these communities and we um, restored their lands appropriately and gave them compensation, um, we, what, what would be happening would be that we would be doing a, a better job. But there'd be other countries um for example um russia which would not be bound by uk regulations and european regulations that would just go continue working in a different environment uh, legislative environment and so therefore it'd be cheaper for them to exploit um and so i think that the realism has to recognize that there is a difficulty if you don't have the same legislative backdrop because the um, political environment, the geopolitical environment, doesn't operate in the same way. But that's where governments have to, um, in uh, the sort of event like COP26, really deal with the issue at the stage beyond which NGOs and individuals as investors um, and investment enterprises can 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 have weight but in fact i think that investors are increasingly seeing their ability to influence um and it's only where you have um uh those distant um yeah, that, that huge distance from any form of um community response that as, as i mentioned with the first category of company that we that you you really don't have um any influence but you know, yes, you're right. The, the, the question implies that we have to have realism, and I agree with that. Thank you. And this question is is, is linked in a way. Um, given the the power of um, shareholders to influence corporate policy, what do you see as the role of institutional investors in affecting change? Um, they're probably um, one of the biggest influencers. I think that. Um, they, their power, their might means that um, they, they can do an enormous amount to, um, with their voting power when it comes to, for example, um, the remuneration of directors um, who were inappropriately incentivized when it comes to um, looking at the report at the end of the year and seeing whether um, it's too uh, profit focused as distinct from being focused on the other key elements of uh, um, the ESG imperatives that I mentioned. Um, they, they can actually um, be quite active. And, and I, I can see their being active more and more. Um, and it, 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 in fact, it's really interesting because I'm increasingly asked whether um, I will get, talk on ESG matters um, to um, such groups and, and I'm pleased about that because they really are taking it very, very seriously. 
Um, and I, I, you know, the, the fact is the planet is in peril and people have realized that. So it's not that the investors are just saying we need to make sure that our investments are reaping a benefit. I mean, it is interesting that if you're now an investor, you have options to put money into ESG funds because people recognize the, the power of um, the lobby and this, this, the, 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 the weight of public opinion that's growing. Um, and and um, uh, you know, Greta Thunberg may say it's all words, but I think that the words are having an enormous impact on the people with the money, and that is great. Thank you. Our, our, our next question relates to the UK Corporate Governance Code, and uh, it, it asks that the, the, the code place greater emphasis on stakeholders' um, interests and society rather than on shareholder value. Um, and that came in in 2018. How um, has much changed since then, do you think, Margaret? Uh, the Governance Code is a code, um, and it, it's still in the land of you know, option, you know, comply or explain. What what I'm saying is necessary and what the Better Business Initiative is saying is necessary is something a bit more compelling than that. Um, and I suppose that the reason that we're saying that is because we don't believe enough has, enough has changed. Things are changing, not quickly enough. So um, uh, that's why I'm advocating um, a stronger mandate because I just don't think that the speed of change is, 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 is fast enough. Margaret, I'm going to take it in a slightly different uh, direction now and it's a, it's a question, um, how do LLB students involve pro bono work to improve their skills? Oh, what a lovely question. Um, okay, uh, when I was um, young, I um, thought about uh, what it might be like to be on a board. And I realized that I had, I, if I went on a board, I'd be neither use nor ornament because I didn't, I, I, I hadn't been on a board. And in a way, it's a little bit like um, an actor getting an equity card. You get an equity card if, you can, if you've been an actor and you can't, get an, you can't be an actor unless you have an equity card. So how do you get on a board? Well, basically, if you... Um, try to help charities. And if you're an LLB student, you've got something already to offer. As, as soon as you become legally aware, you can begin to help charities because the charity world is increasingly a minefield in the same way as other um, uh, um, institutions are, just because the legal complexities are such that they need help with interpretation and support. So you, there is something that you can offer. So you could become a, a, a charity trustee, um, there are huge numbers of charities, so that could help any form of uh, um, interest that you have. Um, you, it's, it's not paid work, and so um, they're crying out for intelligent individuals. And that actually means that, first of all, you're um, improving your own network because there'll be numbers of the great and good on those boards. Um, you're also um, learning more about governance. Um, about strategic thinking, you're learning about the distance between being the operator, the operational thinking, and strategic thinking, which is actually a really, really tough thing to do. Um, and um, you're helping um, organisations forward plan. Um, it's such a really good way of um, giving um, your time at a point when you have more time than you probably ever will, even though you think you don't. Um, I wish I had the time <laughs> that I had when I was a student. Um, so I think that, yeah, that, that's a really good way. And it means that when later on you do want to go on to um, boards um, and build a portfolio, um, you, you then have that uh, um, experience that you can say you, 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 you managed to build up. And also, as I say, you also have um, uh, some really useful contacts that you've begun to make. and beginning with your network so that's a really useful way to begin um citizens with advice bureau again a, a really great ways of um uh, using your your skills on a pro bono way there are so many people who are desperately in need of support and help um 
who, who, who could benefit from your pro bono skills. So great question. Thank you for asking it. And, and Margaret, um, sadly, we are going to have to bring things to an end soon. So this is going to be the, the last question, which is another one that's close to our hearts in terms of working in, in HE, which is um, which ways can the HE, the HE sector regulate good culture and keep learning from those outcomes? Um, again, I'd go back to um, um, openness and transparency. Um, and, and try to get a, a, a culture of allowing people to call out what's wrong in an informal way. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting is um, we're in such a regulated environment that people think that everything that goes wrong needs to be escalated immediately. The downside of that is that if, somebody, if something goes wrong and people don't want to create too much of a fuss, they keep it to themselves. Then inside they're stewing or they're upset and there's no sort of um, release valve. Um, and what creates a better culture is if you imagine that you're part of the airline industry where it would be just dreadful for people to keep it to themselves if something had gone wrong because the repercussions would be just too dreadful to contemplate. So it's better to have a structure that says, just come and tell us. Um, and you know, we can always put it right um, and uh, it's better that we know so that we can deal with it so you set up um, a culture in which um, calling out something that's gone wrong is not called whistleblowing because the moment you call it whistleblowing people become uh, pariahs they become terrified they get stressed um, but call it something like um, uh, statements of possible improvement or opportunities for improvement or something like that so that people recognize that if something's gone wrong you call it out um, you have a line of, of responsibility through which you can call it out or you can step out or some method of stepping out if the if, you, if that line of responsibility isn't isn't isn't, isn't the one that you think um, would best be supportive to you um, and then um, that builds a culture of greater trust. It builds a culture of constant improvement. And I think co constant improvement is the best that you can ask for any enterprise, any organization. Margaret, thank you so much for a really thought provoking um, lecture this evening. I mean, I was really taken by those figures that you mentioned earlier on, you know, particularly about Walmart being the, the I think it's the 10th largest entity in the world behind behind some countries. And just the power that um, social um, movements have in terms of affecting change in the, the, the case study around Spotify and uh, and what's happened with that and uh, the boycott from, I think it was, well, it was Neil Young and other people, wasn't it, to, um, to, to really affect those changes and the effect that that has on, on shareholders and linking across there to some of those questions around what shareholders can do to actually make a change to, um, to board policy. And I, I guess it does, it, to an extent, it does, allow us all to have much more influence either as consumers or or, or or investors you know and if we aren't directly investors through things like pension funds as well so incredibly thought-provoking really really interesting and on behalf of everyone here i'd like to say a, a really big thank you um, for um, coming along and talking to us this evening thank you thank you for inviting me thank you very much it's a great privilege thank you